We're going to have, I'm going to kind of do a little solo walk through and then in, engaging Karen with questions at the same time and then she is the same and then we'll open it up for questions. But um, I walked in here and was really surprised to see all this work because I haven't looked at this work for, for many years. Um, this work comes from 1996. So the um, art and science is 1996 and the, the cross-sections work, which is the cell, cell work and the molecular work, comes from um, 2000. So it's really, it's really old work for me, and yet uh, I just felt when I walked in and saw the, the show, I thought how, how timely and how topical, given that we're coming out of this pandemic. And I, I say coming out because I, I don't really believe it's over yet. So for those of you with masks on, I'm right there with you. Um, without a mask, uh, <laughs> which I have issues with, uh, but I can't talk publicly with a mask well, so. Um, I thought I would just share a little bit, my work has always involved what I would say um, the foundations are, are really about looking at contemporary culture and how culture is shaped by our endeavors, the human are, are, are the human endeavors of, of contemporary culture. And you can't help but think about history as well. So I, I come out of a background of looking at and working with architecture a lot. And architecture still is, um, I think architecture is one of the most important mediums in, in, in contemporary art. And I did a pro, and I, another foundation of work that, of, of an ideas that continue throughout my work. There's linkages and lineages about the way that knowledge gets transferred. How do we learn? How does knowledge happen? So architecture, how does knowledge get transferred? And other ways in which define our, um, our presence. Another book I did um, was called Home and Other Stories, where I looked at our lives through um, the domestic spaces of where we live and all the ways in which it talks about um, who we are. So when I was working on American Classroom in, um, I'm so old I can't remember when, uh, 1987, yeah, 1987, that's when the show opened at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And I, I'm holding this because it was really when I was working on American Classroom and I was doing these photographs of children's science experiments, like grades six, seven, eight science experiments, like this one called um, germination of a lima bean, where you, know, you might remember it, you did this yourselves, so that you put a, 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 a bean, or in this case a lima bean, you wrap it in a, a wet paper towel, and you watch this beginning of this process, the life cycle. Or this one, uh, called Observing Skin's Protective Role. So here, every child is given an apple, and they choose to prick the skin of the apple, and they come back a week later, and they see that apple in various stages of preservation or decay. And so from this kind of seemingly naive um, children's science experiment, again, they're learning about the life-death cycle. And lastly, a very formative photograph for me, um, Alfred University Science Classroom, a tub of frogs awaiting a class to do their first dissection. So in this photograph, I see it as both kind of extremely beautiful and horrific. And I think that there, I think that, um, I'm not an artist who's carrying a picket sign, but I feel that the ways in which I work and the, way, and the kind of content that I tackle, aside from what I hope you see as an aesthetic beauty, that there is um, a very political stance in there. And it's not saying yay or nay, but I feel like I'm offering up content and making these images as beautiful as can be so that once you are, in a way, the strategy of bringing, bringing you to them because of their 
the, the beauty, you are then left to have to wrestle with the kind of content that you're looking at, which you may or may not be interested in, but you're having in some ways to have to kind of raise the bar of, of, of an engagement with this work. So when I finished American Classroom, uh, can I give this to you, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, when I finished American Classroom, I was really struck with uh, those children's science experiments of the photographs I've just showed you. And I was struck with like not really understanding how science um, shapes culture. And yet everything I was reading in the New York Times was about the Human Genome Project and how genetics was going to change the way we live and how genetics was going to change um, the determinants of, of how long one lives or the notion of cloning. And it was both frightening and incredibly exciting at the same time. And so I, I thought th th this whole project of the Human Genome Project, which was often likened to um, the Manhattan Project in terms of the money that was being thrown at it, billions and billions of dollars to determine the, the, gene the, the genetic blueprint of, of a human being. So I wrote a letter to... Um, uh, something called ELSI, Ethical, Social, and Legal Implications of the Human Genome Project, and said I was an artist and that I would like to be, I'd like to, photo, to make still lives from the genetic research of the seven genome sites within the United States. And one thing led to another, and I was funded by certain science foundations to do that, even though they said, lady, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but they, they did fund me to do that. And so I started out and, and in St. Louis at the Washington University, which was one of the human genome sites, um, along with the Los Alamos, Stanford, MIT. Uh, and I started out with like trying to understand kind of basic ideas about science. And I, and I remembered being in college many years before and thinking like, oh my God, you have to take a, a laboratory science in order to finish your degree. And so I wasn't anti-science, I was afraid of science. I was afraid of like, can I do this? You know, I don't know anything about this. It was a little similar to math, which I love now. Um, and so I found out actually when I was in college, like, oh God, you could actually take human sexuality instead of a laboratory science. So I took that <laughs> and I got an A, thank you, I got an A. Um, but it was those, those photographs from American Classroom that really made me start thinking about how does, science, how does science participate in the construction of culture. So with that said, when I first got to um, Washington University, I kept coming through these laboratories and these various laboratories, each, science, each scientific team would be working on a very specific um, silo of, of uh, whether it was material science or the most recent information in pharmacology. Um, and so I decided to take nine laboratories that each one was studying a different aspect of importance in science. And it could be material science, how to build a better airplane wing, to um, most recent HIV research in pharmacology uh, or neurology. And so each one of these, these this piece is called sequential molecules, and each one of these molecular flasks of research are, um, are, are an intensive study on, um, on one aspect of science, in, in specifically to do with genetics. And um, I was struck with uh, the fact that we would never know that information, which I'm telling you now, but that when you come to this piece, there's something kind of like the embracing of wonder and the embracing of information that I thought it, it's, go, it's going to ask people to, if in, in, their, in their own reach to start thinking about science. So that's what this piece is about for me. And I found that the typology was really interesting to work with because scientists are often thinking about that one issue in that one area and not necessarily attaching it to what I would say the greater culture because they're, they're focused on this one area. And I found that to be problematic. And if you think about Frankenstein, which is another project I work on, Frankenstein blew up because there was no place for Frankenstein ever to live. He was made, he was made as this, this monster, and there was never a culture or society to embrace him. 
but I digress. So um, when I saw Karen's work for the first time and I came in here, I was really struck with the kind of the bodily ways in which these sculptures, and I'm not just talking about these phalluses, these hanging phalluses, but this, the reframing of these bodily structures and the ways in which Karen and, and I think Teresa and Rick installed the show, I wasn't here, and the ways that these sculptures kind of start to reframe and, um, and reclassify the photographs. So I felt that there was this really wonderful marriage that was happening, a synchronicity that was happening with these sculptures, um, the, the, the spareness of where she placed them. I thought that was just really terrific. Do, do you want to say something about that and then I'll go back to... Well, I, I want to digress with you for a moment. Um, so uh, just to quote Mary Shelley, my mind was occupied by exploded systems, is a quote from Frankenstein, which always resonated with me quite a lot. I kept thinking about this over and over in my mind's eye. And um, I think our synchronicity really deepens in that you are taking apart the epistemological framework of the scientific project as like this space of the proliferation of Western thought and putting it under this very critical lens by looking at the um, minute mechanisms of science and the, the small considerations um, of exactitude that are evident within the experiment. Mm -hmm. but I was just thinking about this, this Frankenstein quote because I think it's, it's, it's sort of pertinent in the criticality of the works um, and the way that they work together to criticize a structural system which underlies all of it. Yeah, well, Frankenstein it was a, another project I actually in, in, embarked on after this work because I was so interested in, again, Mary Shelley's novel feels like it could have been written today. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, absolutely. Prescient. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so the, 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 these works, um, they're all vintage. They're all gelatin silver prints. I was interested in language as well. I was very interested in the way that here's this very benign language, but it, the, the emphasis is on not, definitely not sterile. And so one of the galleries at the St. Louis Museum of Art was what was sterile and what was not sterile and kind of playing off that idea. Uh, so, so there was a whole group of what I call these still lifes that I would, would I, that I would extract from the laboratories and build this faux, lab, faux um, studio um, and isolate these objects much in the same way that science is often isolating research from its greater implications. So I was kind of like co-opting the methodologies of scientists in order to, it's, it's, it, you know, it, 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 this is a, a benign substance. There's nothing radioactive or anything dramatic about this. But again, that kind of emphasis on language of definitely not sterile. So there's a room, there was a room in the gal at the museum where it was just these um, kind of Morandi-esque like bottles that were, uh, part of this human genome research. So anything that you see, like uh, the gelatin silver stuff, like the three panel, that's called the mating reactions of algae. And they were doing sex experiments there about gender and cloning, and I, and I found that very, um, again, both beautiful and problematic. And I remember taking these Petri dishes out and on a tray, moving them outside into the sun with the permission of the scientists. And, um, and, and I allowed the sun to kind of create these photograms against, um, against the, uh, the kind of blazing white concrete that was behind there. So there was a lot of kind of interaction with the scientists and, and we ended up doing a panel together. And, and um, David, uh, God, he's at Caltech now, Nobel scientist. He, um, he, at the end of this, in our conversations, we, we kind of came to this conclusion that um, we weren't at, at opposing, uh, we weren't in opposition to one another's um, research. In fact, we, we, we had decided that we were actually all climbing the same mountain, all, albeit choosing different paths. And there was a lot of um, kind of exchange and synchronicity about ideas and research. And it was soon after that that I received a fellowship from the San Jose Museum of Art that said we have this fellowship that uh, we're giving to an artist because um, that, that, that has never worked with technology. 
And so they asked me to um, propose a project. And I said, what if I, were, what if I were given the same tools that scientists were given, like the molecular imaging devices, like access to an MRI, or um, the scanning electron microscope? Not, not that I was trying to document science, or not that I was trying to imitate science, but I was thinking that, you know, I wasn't, um, uh, what I could do with the molecular imaging tools was very different than what a camera does. A camera describes information from the outside, but molecular imaging devices describe information from the inside. So I wanted to talk, so these are all cells. Everything that you're seeing here are different cells with scanning lock on a microscope. And um, I thought I wanted to bring Karen into this because I know a lot of your work is, is very much based on kind of thinking about cellular activity. Yeah, yeah, thinking about like cellular memory and cellular knowledge and the knowledge that we carry in our bodies and what the body says to us, how the body speaks to us and through us um, as, as an older system of information than say spoken or written information. You know, we've had physical information for 250,000 years. We've had written information for about 10,000 years, maybe 8,000 years. You know, and then we've had academic information from the year 800, which was like starting with the first medical school in Palermo, which is like the roots of Western epistemology, which is why I became curious about medicine as, mm -hmm. as like this, as this analogy for um, the way that um, cultural information is, 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 is um, gains authority and then is shared and proliferates throughout other types of cultures. And in our case in the West, the way that Western culture has then quite literally colonized other types of uh, knowing, mm -hmm. you know, so other epistemic um, processes, which is super problematic, like to replace land-based learning with the scientific method is like uh, woefully inadequate for understanding place, for example, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, I became, I, became, I became very interested in um, what the body can tell us through meditative process and through intuitive expression in the making of sculptures, which I don't think is terribly different from what most sculptors have done since we were in the caves carving our little Venuses and that, you know? I mean, I think we're up to much of the same thing. Um, I think of it as a very basic form of species expression, but that, that um, predates language and predates epistemic systems, so you can kind of um, override some of that information if you can do guided meditations that can uh, access other types of knowledges that we can hold in our bodies. I wanted to ask you about if you think that there is some cultural relationship between the concepts of science and magic insofar as magic is something that is peripheral and powerful. Do I think there's a, a synchronicity between? Do you think that there is some, some kind of relationship between science and magic, like, like, the, the, like genetic editing? Uh, I sort I, of like, I, yeah. to, to, to me, seems a little bit magical. You know, because I don't hold that information. I don't, I don't know how to cut CRISPR. I mean, yeah. but I could read about it for probably two hours on a YouTube video and like turn a corn into a strawberry plant. I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of veils in terms of science. I mean, for myself, I, I had no idea like how science happens, like and mystery. I, I yeah, there's a lot of mystery, yeah. and I think that there's also a lot of um, um, kind of like hidden things. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested on a sociological level, who makes these decisions mm -hmm. about yeah. what is normal? Yeah. Who decides yeah. whose genome is normal? Mm -hmm. And those kinds of decisions were really impacting me in that um, I, it, I, I did a piece called um, 12 Areas of Concern and Crisis. And each one was a portrait of the interior of a minus 86 degree freezer, where you, that's where the archives of science is stored, in these minus 86 degree freezers. And so in this, tw this portrait of, and I call them portraits, just like in American classroom, I think those are portraits. 
They're without the, the human presence. I mean, they're without the, the, um, the, they're not a photograph of a person, but they are very much about the human presence. So I, I often see my work as being very portrait based. Mm -hmm. And so the, that piece, 12 Areas of Concern and Crisis, each one was a portrait of a different disease that's impacting the way that culture moves forward, human beings. So there was breast cancer, there was Alzheimer's, there was alcoholism, there was um, cloning, there was all of these implications there. And it really made me think about in whose hands is this information to be decided. Mm -hmm. And again, I wasn't trying to say this is the right way to think about it, this is the wrong way to think about it, but I, I'm offering up that, that to us philosophically, because I think um, these are these are these are big questions about what if what if they do, what if they can cure cancer and nobody dies of cancer anymore? What happens to our own culture if disease is cured? What happens if people say, you know, I really only want to have a baby that is going to be tall and blonde and this? I mean, those kinds of things I found very disturbing. And I, was, I wanted to kind of offer up these, these um, and, and you bring in the word magic. And I think when I made these photographs, there, were, there was something very magical about them. Seeing through, scanning electron microscopes and isolating things. That piece right there on the wall is called single cell. And to me, I mean, metaphorically, it looks like, you know, the world, mm -hmm. okay? It looks like the world. And it's reduced down to this, this image blown up, you know, billions of billions of time of a single cell. So those kinds of things, I often use the word, God, this just, it felt magical to me to kind of unearth this, this information. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know about science and magic and that kind of cross, that kind of cross section, but I do, I do see this sense of wonder in a lot of, in a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really think that piece right there is called left brain, right brain, and they're not brains at all. Um, they're, they're crystals that were being studied to figure out how to build a stronger bone. And, and that exhibition I did was a fictitious journey through the body uh, from this body of work called cross sections. And so I continued to name things these, with these bodily references. Uh, because that was the journey at the, the museum it showed in. And actually, um, I was just talking to Norman. Um, Connie Butler was the run who, one who wrote the essay for, um, for the cross-sections work on that. Uh, so it was very much about this cellular journey through the body. And those aren't brains, but they were, about the stud they were, they were studying these crystals to um, figure out how to make a better human bone for, for people. So... Um, do you we, think that microscopic imaging takes on a generally uh, pandemic type consideration? Do you think people think about viruses now because we've been exposed at this moment for three years of nonstop kind of um, artistic imaging of what certain cells look like inside of the body? Do you think that, that there is like an automatically viral association with cellular imaging, given our I, current I cultural context? I kind of hope context? not. I kind of hope that. Yeah, right? I hope, I hope that it hasn't blanketed all the possibilities of us looking at things other than thinking about spike proteins. Yeah, it's not just all I just, we are. I, I, I hope <laughs> that, you know, that we will prevail and, and we already are trying to figure out how to live within this paradigm. So um, these, these cellular dances, if you will, and these cellular kind of, I see them more lyrically and I see mm -hmm. them also um, uh, po politically in, in the ways that I mentioned. But I, I would really like to turn this over to Karen now because I think I have so a question highly. first. I have okay. a question first. Can Questions are at um, the end can, of this. Uh, no. But uh, no, 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 if no. I can ask you, like, um, just now that we're speaking of it, this like really kind of immediate uh, relationship between these petri dishes and the creation of culture, is that something that you're thinking about, like making culture? Literally, well, when I'm when I'm working, I'm, I'm never thinking about the meaning. Okay. In fact, okay. my mantra when I'm working is the meaning comes last. Yeah, I agree. Because I agree. the moment I start editing myself when I'm in the studio or when I'm trying to write or when I'm trying to do stuff, 
I'm editing myself in ways that stops the creative flow. It becomes like work of repression rather than of well, exploration it just, it, or something. It, it's like I'm trying to find a structure before I did the research. Uh -huh. yeah. And so yeah. I'm a firm believer as an artist in jumping in without the life preserver on and having enough faith after doing this for close to 40 years that I am going to bob back up and that something there and that meaning will come from this. And it's not that I'm just shooting in the dark and, and, and starting without some kind of an outline. I'm, I'm always starting with some kind of an outline, but I never know what I'm doing because if I knew what I was doing, I'm no longer that interested in it. So I'm, I'm for, far more interested in that idea of, of jumping in without the life preserver. And then 30 years later, coming to discover your work and, and this exhibition and, and all the new facets and ways in which make me rethink about this work. So. I want to thank you. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. you. So, Wonderful. So, please, Karen. Um, yeah, wow. There's a lot to dig into here. So, um, and I'm not exactly sure where to start, but I'll start with some really interesting facts that are kind of structurally underlying this exhibition, which is that I also started the project which is represented here. These are mostly works from 2019. Uh, but they're begun in 2017 um, when I was a Fulbright scholar in London. I was at St. Martin's in residence, but I don't really have a job other than to research. So I was researching at the Welcome Collection um, at the libraries, which is like quite a comprehensive uh, uh, history of medicine collection. And so I was there as a reader, and I was reading there pretty much every day for a while. Also at the Dana Research Center, um, of the Science Museum in London, which were very, very generous with me, and then at Kew Libraries as well. So I was looking at the roots of uh, Western medicine. I wanted to figure out how it got started, how, um, like, like pre-apothecary, I wanted to figure out what ancient medicine was like in, um, in the Celtic and Anglo-Saxon worlds. And at the time, I was also living in between London and the Amazon rainforest, which sounds a little bit, uh, I know, it's like it, there was a little contrast there. That was a little strange. I was living in a really little pueblo, and I was learning a lot about forest medicine and, uh, from the curanderos, who are like, they're pharmacists, they're jungle pharmacists, because you can't really buy pills if you don't have money there, and almost nobody has money because of corruption, essentially. Things are expensive and people make very little money. So they use like herbal simples, mostly from the jungle, to cure any, any health issues that they have. Um, and then you learn a lot about the mythologies within the Pueblo and the Cosmovision, which is the sort of ritualized representation of space and time. And then I'm going back and looking at all of this material through a very um, colonial indexical context and uh, the contrast was really quite jarring. Uh, I started to kind of want to take apart this idea of like uh, organiza organization of, of natural systems into cultural systems or into digestible little little bites that we can handle sort of. So I started to want to critique like structures of basic taxonomy or the tree of life, you know. Have you ever seen the tree of life? You know who's at the bottom is like mosses and ferns and single cell organisms and at the top is like people. Chimpanzees and orangutans are the next branches. It's really obnoxious. It's like this like evolutionary framework that's like deeply anthropocentric, deeply patriarchal, and deeply colonial. It's super problematic. So I wanted to look at the roots of Western epistemology and belief and to start to play with it in a really bodily way and to take it apart in a way that was like, ended up being quite kind of, um, not necessarily psychedelic, but wanted, I wanted to kind of take advantage of viewers like pattern finding mechanisms to start like replicating these um, almost viral type of forms that were grow, these like organic yet geometric forms that are growing in space. And they were initially based on these taxonomical trees. You know, like the, the pointing to a thing and saying, that's new to my culture, so it's new to everyone. And I found it, and it means something, and it's important, and I'm going to bring it home, and we're going to be rich. Which is like colon colonialism in science, or in botany, is when um, a plant takes over another plant and smothers it. You know, for example, a strangler fig, that's a colonial plant. So even the, the colonial project is deeply flawed from its name onwards, you know. Um, 
Uh, and I, I did want to I did want to start cutting that apart and looking at it a little bit and looking at the roots of Western epistemology and thinking about ways in which we could start to incorporate different types of cosmologies and different types of broadened perspectives or like consciousness types like so I, I wanted to try to get into the mindset of ancient people in a way to try to imagine how they inhabited their bodies and their relationships to the to the natural world which was one uh, of um, I think relative uh, synchronicity you know when one is confronting one's animal self every day as we were for many many thousands of years you know, pre-language certainly every single day, and then a little onwards. Like this idea that we've ever been separate from nature is a really funny thing. And then, like one cool thing, I guess, that the pandemic has done is sort of like has centered this this um, idea that habitat encroachment creates this like natural response. It, it creates a natural response mechanism from within the earth to give us this virus that will replicate and replicate and replicate. You know, we push and she has a way to defend herself. So I, I started making these images, these objects, images, defenders. Defenders is actually the name of this thing, this uh, spike, which is like an acrylic spike that, um, that is to uh, church. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is, uh, it's the name of the product to um, evade pigeons, and pigeons are native to the cliffs outside of Rome. And Western epistemology has traveled very much with that, um, that original, like, giant colonial culture um, everywhere it's gone and brought these guys with us. Um, that creates this uh, sort of um, a source of food, but, um, but obviously um, something that's been wildly successful and too successful for, for its own good, you know, to the point at which we're repulsed by ourselves in a quite natural way. So I was like, I was looking at um, poison caterpillars mostly in the Amazon when I started to like concept out these pieces and sort of creating this relationship between um, invasive species, feminine uh, defense systems of the earth, and kind of um, potential feminine violence in defense of the earth, kind of like a Gaia and, you know, eco-feminist rising up. You know, this is pre-COVID as well that I started to create these forms that ended up looking quite a lot like viral forms. And I was thinking about them as these kind of viral replicating forms prior to COVID, but they kind of took on their own life during the pandemic. And now, um, now here they are. And I haven't made new ones since the pandemic began. Um, but yeah, their, their original intent was very much kind of uh, to do something like the pandemic has now illustrated it broader in, in broader culture. Um, and these are like, these are works that I also, I think that, that um, Catherine and I were speaking about um, kind of thinking about culture outside of human lifespans and thinking more about like a much longer trajectory of us as a species and kind of trying to share species level relevant information. Yeah, sure. Um, so I started to make these kind of tree like forms, which are also very body like forms that, that, that um, are created like very much in relationship to um, to human bodies and my human body. Um, this series is called Pulling Through, which is based on a type of kind of, I, I mean, you would call it a medi medicinal ritual, right? That um, to, to cure all kinds of ailments, that would be like a, a ritual of magical transference. So you would move through a hole in an object. For example, the men on toll stones in Cornwall. I don't know if anyone is familiar with those, but they're sort of circular stones that children are supposed to crawl through to cure the rickets. Um, but that's sort of, that's just one example, and that's sort of like the current understanding of what those stones are meant for. But they're megalithic structures, so this is a ritual that was practiced from Neolithic times, like 
Uh, so we're talking a couple thousand years before Christ until the 20th century. So they were practiced for really quite a long time. And I was looking at a lot of rituals in, in Western culture that were practiced for really a lot of time. These were also practiced, glo practiced globally. So another example would be to cut a tree as when it's a sapling and to split it in two and then, um, and then to pass somebody through that opening as if they were being reborn or to transfer their illness to the structure itself, that the structure itself will absorb it and thrive on it, meanwhile the patient improves. Right, so, um, so, so pulling through or passing through is a ritual that was practiced for a long time. These are structures that are meant to be kind of passed through, where, where somebody could potentially create these openings that correspond to orifices or limbs of the body where people can also pass through to gain, um, to gain this benefit. So this, this idea of placebo effect, right? what placebo effect is in its nature, I think it's gonna change very radically with new studies in neuroscience. So I think in the next 20 years, we're gonna have a name for what that is, and we might start to know what consciousness is. You know, scientists are studying what consciousness is and how we form that, and they're not, they, they, they know it's not necessarily the body, but it kind of is the body that like the body as the self or what the self is, we just don't know really very much. We're too young, you know? And I guess like I wanted to go back into ancient cultures to, um, to figure out just how non-linear progress in culture is, I guess, and to look at little nuggets from the past to see what we might learn. In particular, I was looking a lot about curses and cures for curses, and then compare, comparing the symptoms of curses from the past to symptoms for things like, um, of things like anxiety and depression today, and they're almost identical. So then, what if, the, what if those cures for curses from the past actually work on what's hurting us today? You know, what if, what if we miss something? What if we miss something becoming increasingly specialized and forgetting about these like broad um, and deep understandings that we need in order to survive in any place, any specific place? They're aluminum, they're solid cast aluminum, so they come from the earth. And um, yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was a really long. <laughs> no, no, no. Lead also comes out of alchemy, so I was wondering. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do like. I do like the alchemical um, relationship, though. So I don't mind it if they do look like lead, and they they look like kind of newly minted lead too, like newly processed lead, which is quite bright before it starts to oxidize. It actually does look quite a lot like aluminum. So yeah, you're right. So, yeah. yeah. I think Catherine started getting cooked. Were you able to hear me? Oh, good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Philip. I think that's a really interesting question. I guess I see, um, I see the roots of Western science being very white Christian male. Um, to be very frank with you, the entire uh, uh, colonial project was kind of predicated on a certain type of discovery that was very extractive, you know? Um, so so um, I guess I consider the objectivity of science to be quite subjective. That, so this is interesting. So if we look at like new studies in consciousness, uh -huh. um, and if you hear like a, a neuroscientist who's studying the nature of consciousness talking with like a Buddhist monk, mm -hmm. that they they actually have extremely synchronistic ideas yeah, about the nature of the mind. Yeah, yeah. So I actually don't see those as being separate. So I was raised like with the Tibetan Buddhist in a Tibetan Buddhist household, and on with that, like this this concept of animism was very much like present and a part of my life. So.
Um, so, so yeah, for, and, I, and then I also attended a natural science school, so I think in my very early development, those dovetailed, like whatever, whatever science and, and belief were to me became kind of one thing. Well, I became very anti-religion for a while, and especially what I saw as being like um, Westerners running to the East for answers, and that was also me being critical of my parentage, and which was a little bit ignorant of me, you know. But you can only run so far from who you are, right? <laughs> and then there you are still, like just like as as Ron would say, doing backflips to get away from yourself. Um, so yeah, I was I was really into Western medicine in like my early 20s, and then by my late 20s, I was like burning incense and growing herbs again, like as I was in my teens as well. So and now I have like a medicinal plant garden, and I try to let the um, uh, I try to as much as I'm able to, you know, in a human body, leave my anthropocentrism out the door and focus on relationships with other species and their sentience as well, and respecting their sentience. I think we're going to turn the air conditioning back on. <laughs> that seems like a yeah. good idea. And then and I wanted to thank Karen and Catherine yeah. for, uh, for this wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay. Let's get this guy back on.